Hello everyone, welcome to our Let's Play series of Disco Elysium. This is Colonel RPG as usual, and I'm very happy to have you here with me as I have a chat with Kim, because that's what we're here for. Okay, what do you think is going on with that computer, chalkboard, and fireplace? Hmm, someone tried to exorcise the curse using technology? No, that's not it. I think... And the lieutenant takes a step back, steepling his hands. Like he's ready to lay out a fine theory, crafted together like a puzzle box. It looks like one of those popular pen and paper role-playing games. Only these people were trying to automate it, make it work on radio computers. Has anyone ever done this before? Not to my knowledge. They make automated games in Grad, Messina, Konigstein. You know, places with industry. But I don't think anyone has attempted to create an inter game before. We just don't have the technology. How were they planning to do that? Through calling stations. He nods at the fireplace. None of the players have to be physically present. Anyone in the world can participate in the game, as long as they have a two-way radio. Then there's the Game Master frequency that listens in on the smaller calling stations. I think that was supposed to coordinate the stories, functioning as a master of ceremonies of sorts. His fascination has swept aside other concerns for the moment. He's a little hooked. Coordinating so many games would take a whole switchboard of people, possibly divided into sub-frequencies. And this was a role-playing game? Indeed. Those Welkins are a dead giveaway. He points to the chalkboard. Role-playing people love that stuff. The world looks like a modified version of the Wii World board game, with heat death thrown in. What do you think happened to the company? No idea. They stopped filling out the schedule on the chalkboard. Wow. Indeed, it's ambitious and untethered from reality, but... The lieutenant tilts his head, thinking. The curse got them. I see no other explanation. Ah, yes. The doom of bad business practices. The lieutenant looks around the derelict room. The pipes howl and a rat crosses the floor. Okay. He concludes. Let's keep moving. Let's... There's noises all around. I'm not really sure what those are supposed to be. But I don't actually know that... I don't remember if there's anything else that we skipped, basically. We come from the... Yeah, from here, from the gym. And that's it. I think that's it. Hmm... Am I wrong on that? No. No. It is definitely it. Yeah. It's a, kind of a surprise. I always thought this was bigger. But no. Hey. Hello. Oh, it's you again. Are you looking for a die? I'm, I have questions about this building. I'm listening. There used to be a hair salon here, right? Yes. I think it was called Androgynous Orlando or something similar. They weren't a big hit around here. Turns out that working class men don't like genderless haircuts. They're scared of that word. You wouldn't like it either. The others would laugh at you. I wouldn't like it either. The others would laugh at me. It's not about the haircut. It's about the confidence. I guess I'm a simple man. I don't really have any opinions on hairstyles. Me neither. I just want it off my face. She tucks a strand of hair under her headscarf. Did someone here make stuffed animals? I saw mounts lying around. You mean Mr. Fabron, the taxidermist? No, he mostly just did drugs. But what drugs exactly? I need to know what drugs he was doing for my uh, police report. He got high on some weird taxidermy chemicals. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Eventually, they caused him to lose control of his bladder. The smell was awful. Even you can probably do better than that. I probably can do that better than that. I found creepy mannequins. They used to be a fashion atelier here, but I have forgotten the head designer's name. They were doing well for a couple of years until the insect rights activists came. It, uh, I didn't know insects had any rights or activists. Yeah, the atelier didn't know it either. 
they produced a certain collection that used chitin among the materials. Apparently chitin is made in the Occident, where it's extracted from beetle wings. And you know how all kinds of political movements are big in the Occident. The activists shut down the biggest chitin supplier, which of course caused the price to skyrocket. And, naturally, all the most fashionable tastemakers refused to be seen in chitin from then on. The atelier went bankrupt before they could finish the collection. But insects don't have any brains or feelings. Actually, insects do have brains. She corrects you. But, but yes, I understand what you're saying. I think the protesters took it a little too far. As she shifts around, you notice several dead flies on the windowsill in front of her. Legs up. They're not moving. Anything else? I found a strange machine. Fortress Accident, the radio game studio. She closes her eyes as some remnant of a memory lights her face up. They were an interesting bunch. We talked about role-playing systems every now and then. Once, I even saw two of them get into fisticuffs over Wiro. They certainly took their work very seriously, even if they seemed to be chronically liberal with their schedules. Hmm. <laughs> What do you mean liberal? What happened? The usual. They ran out of money and couldn't get the project done on time. What went wrong? Well, I did hear them talking at times. She looks at the hallway as if she can still hear them chit-chat behind her curtains on a cigarette break. They seemed to believe they were historical individuals on some grand quest. I would... <laughs> to make uh, an RPG. I mean, it's innovative, so... Yeah, I suppose they could be historical individuals. Uh, the um, This thing here about the cigarette break... I... I don't know what this means. But I think it, me it, I think it means that in this setting, it is not common for people to smoke while they're at work. And... Uh, I just... I'm just thinking that that's not necessarily... Uh, what you would expect from a setting like this, is all I'm saying. Because in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 50s, everybody smoked at work. It just, it was just how that worked. Well, not everybody, but, you know, there was no cigarette breaks. You, you, you smoked while you worked. But, I mean, I didn't live back then, so, like, my only perception is from pictures and, and movies and series and all that. So, I don't know. Either way, moving on. She sounds almost mocking when she says that. From what I've seen so far, the project did look quite impressive. Yes, but when the money started to run out, they just began to complain a lot about capitalism. You know, how the markets are rigged to keep out new businesses and so on. In the end, they just didn't get it done. They didn't have enough willpower to produce something truly historic and to show up to work on time. Showing up to work on time is hard. No, scratch that. Showing up to work at all is difficult, especially if you've been drinking. You're right, they should have just tried harder. They had everything needed to succeed. Still, not everyone is going to make it. That's the nature of the game. She tosses a pair of dice on the table. One of them stops near the edge of the metallic desk. That's the nature of the game. That it, mm. I mean, she's written, she's written to be the commentary about all the things, not just this isn't happen. Because if I if this was just a person saying this, I would say you're so close, <laughs> you're so close to getting it. Because it's it's the game is a, is a, is designed by nature to make sure that not everyone makes it, which means that it's a bad game, isn't it? But my character wouldn't say that. My character was, would be like, no, it's the curse. It must be, or pull yourself up by your bootstraps or something. The result is one on a 20-sided die. Anything else? I have more questions about the intercom. I think I didn't ask everything. I'm pretty sure it still doesn't work, but sure. What do you want to know? No, I think I asked everything. Sure, I'm listening. Other questions? Good, I hope it clarified things a bit. What else? I came back to pick my die up. Very good. That will be seven real for one custom die. Here you go. Here's the cursed die you ordered. 
The dice maker opens her desk drawer and hands you a tiny black sphere with six phrases written on it. I'm going to read the phrases. The phrases read, God is indifferent. Take all. Lose all. 50-50. Nothing happens. And pale. What is this? It's a die. Confirms the dice maker with a subtle smile on her face. Try rolling it. Well, it's the cursed die. Did I actually? I didn't hover over it long enough to uh, to show what it was, and I can't access my inventory from here, even though I really think we should be able to do that because it's it's handy. But it's it's kind of it's kind of usually the only thing I actually want to access while I'm in. Well, not not really. This one is handy as well. But the inventory, I should be able to. Either way, um, let's cast the cursed die. You throw the ball on the floor, and it ends with one of the phrases facing upwards. God is indifferent. She looks at the result. Good. Now roll again, detective. I'm gonna roll again. It lands on exactly the same result. God is indifferent. It declares again. It's a sphere pretending to be a six-sided die. Each roll will end with one of the phrases facing up. The die originates in Il Mara, where it was used for clerumancy. Except I've weighted the die. When you try rolling it, you realize that each time it gets you exactly the same result. God is indifferent. This is our curse. Thanks. I'll keep it. Good luck, officer. She says with a mischievous smile, before turning back to her table. I did ask for a cursed die, yeah. And now I can do a shivers check. Why hasn't her business failed? And again, I would like to access my inventory. But I can't. I need to exit the dialogue. And the reason why... Well, we can look at the die, which is pretty cool. This spherical die with an octahedral cavity and a small internal weight will settle with one of the six phrases facing up. God is indifferent. Take all. Lose all. 50-50. Nothing happens. And pale. It's made of bog oak burl, coloring it malevolent black. Note, all caps, exclamation mark, look at the map tab in the journal to see which white checks have opened. What? Well, shivers. That's, no, the, 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 the check, the check might, must be because of, like, look at this. You see? Yeah. Um, it, I, it, I didn't have a plus one. But it must be because of uh, a plus one in the um, in the things when you're looking at the checks. Let me just go through my shiver pants around here. And that's it. It's only the shirt and the jacket. Fine enough. And now I should have quite a much better chance by now, actually. Because from 42 you go up to 58 and then to 67, I think. It's pretty decent. So let's look at the map. And we have the novelty dice maker. Yes, that did check out. And the warded door for the pain threshold? No, uh, yeah, I don't need to do that. We opened it. Map wall. We we can do the map wall again? Lovely. Lovely. Oh, it's you again. Are you looking for a die? 72%, yeah. Why hasn't her business failed? A gust of cold air sweeps through the chimney. The stones and minerals on the shelves rattle as though agitated. For a moment, it almost feels as though you're outside the building, exposed to the atmosphere. This is just the theory, but hear me out. I think I know why your business hasn't failed. Didn't we already talk about this? She asks as the wind continues to seep in through the cracks in the old chimney. It's because you're not in the same building as the others. This isn't technically the doomed commercial area. What are you talking about? She says, shaking her head. My address is exactly the same. Rue de Sanguelan 10. No, the old coal plant that used to be here was subsumed into the new venture. Its ruins swallowed up. Yet it has a different address in the heart of the city. No, this used to be a coal plant. And I'm going to touch the safety curtains. You're in a chimney of another building. This doesn't make any sense. She looks around the makeshift nest that she has carved out for herself, bewildered. Are you saying my business was spared because of a technicality? Where is this coming from? Let's 
say I have my own methods. Unusual methods. And what? Does it mean that I'm safe from failure? Rest assured, no psychic attacks will reach you here. She starts laughing. <laughs> her fingers trying to rub away the exhaustion from her face. What? Do you know what this is? She raises her hand to reveal a piece of metal shining on her index finger. It looks like a regular piece of jewelry to me. It's a morning ring. She replies. I made this when my first company failed. It was a small jewelry shop right here in the East Delta Commerce Center, built with the little I inherited from my parents. I drove it into the ground within a year. I didn't have what you would call a viable business plan. See, the curse is real! I bet you didn't run this jewelry shop from the protective depths of the chimney. No, you're right. I didn't. She laughs again. <laughs> But it sounds rather small and sad. It wasn't just the jewelry shop either. I always thought that it was just the world that you were supposed to try again and again until you finally succeed. And now you're telling me what? She closes her eyes. That it was all because I didn't run my little shops and ventures from a dump inside an abandoned chimney? Yes, coincidence is all that safeguards us. Yeah. She stares out of the window, not really hearing your words. Or maybe it's the entire world that's cursed. It's such a precarious place. Nothing ever works out the way you want it. That's why people like role-playing games. You can be whoever you want to be, you can try again. Still, there is something inherently violent even about dice rolls. That word right there is carrying a lot over here that word right there because if she had said there's something inherently violent about dice rolls you just you know she's just making a statement but when she says even it means that it's in relation to something else there's something inherently vital uh, violent about the game that she was talking about before the one where the nature of the game is that not everyone makes it yeah, that's inherently violent. That's a subtext. I'm not sure that's the that's what her character actually means. I think it's just sparse, you know, speckled here and there, some of the little clues here. Because I don't think that she gets it. I don't think she's... Um, I, I don't think she's based, is what I'm saying. It's like every time you cast a die, something disappears. Some alternative ending or an entirely different world. She picks up a pair of dice from the table and examines them under the light. But anyway, thanks for sharing your theories, officer. She gives you a tired smile, and I gain a thought. The pre precarious world. Seems like the point of this game is victory. The absence of the feet on all fronts. Victory in business ventures and creative undertakings. Victory in love and over other people. Political victory. Ideological victory. Hell, even sexual victory. Definitely a lot of object-based victories, too. Having things and not losing them. One problem, though. Not a lot of victors in sight. Everyone's mostly losing. Why is that? And why do you not lose? Well, that sounds like a good thought to internalize. But I think I remember what this one does. I mean, I don't remember what it does, but I do know that. All red checks fail. That's the temporary research bonus, which only lasts for four hours, which is pretty decent. And uh, doing it early is actually pretty... That's, that's totally fine. That's totally fair. And I think it would work for us at the moment. Um, but I remember mostly being regretful regretful of, of choosing this in my first playthrough because I had some very, very important red checks. Some easy red checks as well. Really, like, 97% red checks, like, two of them <laughs> that automatically failed because I was internalizing this thought. Uh, and I remember the end result not being good or not being something that I liked. So, we'll not do that. Even though it is a very important thought in terms of the writing. But there it is. Uh, it's not important for the storyline. Uh, it's important for our checks. So, let's look at some walls again. This is my favorite pastime. Kim doesn't like it, though. He's, uh... He, he, he's not a wall person. Which, uh... I can sympathize with, I suppose. 
And maybe be, maybe we're gonna be able to kick the wall or something and heal. We don't need to heal. We, we could take more drugs. I think we're good. I need more drugs, though. You know, to bring my skills up and all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, I need to talk to you as well. Excuse me. <laughs> She's still searching for a book, her eyes wandering over the colorful grid of soft covers. Um, protect and serve, madam. I found your husband. God damn it, I already told you. My husband isn't missing. She crosses her arms. But you said he didn't know where he was. And I specifically added that I didn't need to know where he was. Well, I found him nevertheless. I'm, I'm that good. Very well, then. Where is he? She's getting impatient. Her hands now picking on a random book cover. There! And I'm gonna point to the working class drunk down, down near the sea. Excuse me? She blinks. I, I don't follow. I found a working class drunk and I thought he might be yours. Right, cause working class women come with alcoholic husbands. She glances over your shoulder towards the drunk. You know what? Uh, uh what? You were right. I do have an alcoholic husband. Although not that one. Ha, ah, blam, knew it. So he's missing as well? No, he's not. Or maybe he is, I don't know. He's probably in the park or in Shamrock somewhere, drinking with his friends. She looks away. I haven't seen him for... Well, to hell with him. She has completely forgotten about her books, staring blank into the distance instead. Kim, is it just me, or do we have a missing persons case here? I wouldn't be so sure. He replies before turning to face the working class woman. Ma'am, just to be completely clear, do you want to report it to the police? Report what? He's just out drinking with his friends. I'm sure the police has better things to do than to chase down local goofballs. Not at all. The RCM is ready to chase down every goofball in town. We care about you. She sighs, but you can detect a slight hint of gratitude and relief from her face. All right, go ahead. Do you have any questions? What does your husband look like? Honestly, not that different from you. She eyes you from head to toe. So let me guess, he's disco. Oh, thank God, no. She nearly begins to laugh. It hasn't come down to this yet. Why did you say that your husband resembles me then? Well, he's slightly chubby. Wait, did she just imply that you're fat? You're not fat. The body type she's referring to is called a Franco-Nigerian hard body. Yeah, I'm not chubby and neither is your husband. What you meant to say is that we both share a franco niger What was the? Niger Franco-Nigerian hard body, that's the one. You both share what? She doesn't understand. Franco-Nigerian -Niger hard body. Softly round, yet still in shape. Ladies dig it. I'm not sure about the rest, but softly round sounds about right. He's not in great shape. She stops to think. What else? He was wearing a dark brown leather jacket with a bright blue inner lining. The lining is hand-sewn. I made it myself. She sighs, her voice slightly quivering when she adds... It's his cool jacket. God knows it's too cold to run around in this, but he refuses to change. Who cares about the cold when you have your cool jacket to wear? You can completely sympathize. I even tried throwing it away once, but he just dug it out of the bin. Can you believe it? She looks back at you, shaking her head. Well, if that jacket is really that cool, then I, I, I can totally understand. Well, what can you do? I hope that at least that extra lining helps him keep warm at night. I wouldn't like him to catch cold. When did you last see him? Yesterday morning. He went to the library. Her eyes become cold with recollection. He went to retrieve my book and he promised, he promised, he'd walk straight back home. Because we talked about this. We talked about not wandering off again. She scoffs. I, I don't know what to do. I honestly don't know what to do with his addiction. Just makes me feel weak. Gone for around 36 hours then. 
Damn, this is a missing persons case. She turns away from you in an attempt to recover. I think I got it. Thanks. So you are going to look for him? She genuinely wants you to know. Don't make her ask. Yes, I will bring him back home to you. Thank you. You sense gratitude in her voice. Please do. Even though I'm sure he will return home by himself. I'm still sure of that. I'm sure he will too. When he does, would you let Prison 57, Kim Kitsuragi, know? He gives her a slip of paper. I will, of course, officer. As I said, it's probably nothing. The woman takes the slip of paper. It's a phone number. Okay, thanks. I'll uh, I'll get going then. I was playing, paying cl close attention to that dialogue there. To try to figure out why it works so well. Uh, it, it's, yeah. If you know what, um, uh, if you know who her husband is and what we need to do to complete the quest, because it is a quest, find working class husband. Uh, if you know what, uh, who he is, then I think rereading or rewatching that dialogue there, my takeaway is that they really focus on the sort of day-to-day -day routine things of her character and her husband's character. And so it characterizes them as very humane first and foremost and, and less so about their role in a story or anything like that. And so I think that's how it, that's why the end of this particular quest works so well. At least I think it works really, really well. I think it, it was, it's definitely one of the most memorable uh, parts of the game. I mean, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of parts of this game are the most memorable parts of the game. This is one of them. And, um, yeah, I was just paying attention to that. Uh, I could go in and uh, get her husband right now. Right now. I know exactly where he is. And uh, I know who he is. And uh, ob obviously we don't know who he is. But now we have the, the brown jacket and the uh, the blue lining. So that's, that's something to go on. Uh, but I might not do it. I might not do it. Because the reason... Or because it, it, he's, he's across the canal. We can't get him on this side of Martinez. We need to go across the canal. And I think Kim would, would complain. So we are going to finish... First off, we're going to do the wall thing. But we're also going to need to go back to Evart. No, we yeah, we're waiting for the two signatures for Evart. And then we can do that. Um, we also have the Cryptozoologist thing. There's, there's a few quests already on the other side of the canal. But we're going to focus on the, the... We need to confront Klaji now. Again. Yeah, we're going to do that. Uh, but first, the wall. Actually, not first, the wall, because we're out of time for the day. So, th yeah, it will be the first thing in the next episode. But for right now, I'm Colonel RPG, and this has been Disco Elysium. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you did, go ahead and leave a comment, like the video. But above all, thank you so much for watching, and I hope I'll see you next episode. Bye-bye.